Hello everyone and welcome to this special conference about suicide prevention organized by the British Union of Spiritist Societies in partnership with the Irish Spiritist Federation, Kardec Radio and the Ambassadors of Life campaign in respect of World Suicide Prevention Day which is on 10th September every year. Hello, my name is Adam Osborne and I'm here to welcome you to this event. Now today is a very significant day, as it is also the 20th anniversary of the September 11 attacks in America, where thousands of people lost their lives, and which also resulted in additional lost lives lost afterwards, as people tried to cope with the repercussions and trauma of that event. As such, on a day like today, when we are here talking about the often taboo subject of suicide, we should remember all those around the world who have taken their lives due to the various forms of difficulties. Because suicide affects all races, all religions, all cultures, all countries. And of course, the families and friends of those who take their lives are impacted heavily as well. This is a very delicate subject matter, usually surrounded with taboo and shame. So we would like to say, if you are in any way affected by this, either as someone who's going through a bad moment, or friends and family of someone who is severely unhappy, please contact a support organisation or therapist as soon as is possible. There is no shame in saying that you are not okay. There's no shame in admitting that you may need help. And if you do need support, we do have some details here for you. So, in the UK, you can contact, in the UK and Ireland, in fact, you can contact the Samaritans on 116123. You can call them at any time, or you can email them at joe at samaritans.org or joe at samaritans.ie. Crisis Text Line is a free service which offers uh, text message support, which can also be contacted at any time. And in the UK, you can contact them by texting SHOUT to 85258. In Ireland, you can text HELLO to 50808. And in the United States, text HOME to 741741. And also in the United States, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline can be contacted at any time on 1-800-273-8255. Now, these details are already in the description of this event, and we will put them online on screen again later. So let's get on with the talks itself. So today we have five prestigious people who will be giving us their insight on the main topic of understanding why life is always worth it. We will have with us Dr. Peter Fenwick, who we've just forgotten needs to help to share his slides in just a moment. <laughs> so Peter, if you want to get your slides prepared now, now's a good time. We'll have Dr. Peter Fenwick talking about shining a light on suicide. We will have Tanya Stevanin talking about how to make the most of the Spiritist teachings to fight against suicidal thoughts. Dr. Mick Collins will be with us talking about finding our way through challenging times. Marina Stegall will be talking about becoming an ambassador for life. And finally, We'll have Fernanda Perini, who will talk about how to have faith and find hope. Now, we will have a Q&A with all of these guests, so feel free to send any questions at any time. And please also send us a hello, let us know where you're watching from, and make sure that you share and like this event. Now, as a note, um, unfortunately, Peter has just disappeared. We'll wait for him to come back. So as a note, um, we can only see your comments and questions if you are watching on the Facebook or YouTube channels of the British Union of Spiritist Societies, 
the Irish Spiritist Federation, or Cardiac Radio. If you're watching anyone anywhere else, unfortunately, we will not be able to see your comments. So, um, as I said, unfortunately, Peter is having a couple of technical difficulties right now. We will try and get him back with us. Yep, he's here with us now. So let's bring on our first guest. So, Peter Fenwick. Hello, Peter. Peter F was a was formerly the consultant in charge of the neuropsychiatric and epilepsy unit at the Maudsley Hospital. He is co-director of research at the Department of Neurophysiology, Broadmoor Hospital, and consultant neuropsychiatrist at the London Sleep Centre, running a clinical and forensic practice. Dr. Fenwick has been studying magne magnetic field tomography at the Riken Neuroscience Institute in Japan. In the UK, he is researching near-death experiences in coronary care units and surveying approaching death experiences in hospices and nursing homes in southern England. And Dr. Fenwick is the chairperson of the British Spiritist Medical Association. Peter, hello. Thank you for being with us. Now, how are you, and what can you tell us about shining a light on suicide? Uh, thank you very much, Adam. Thank you for the welcome. Um, as you said, I am a neuropsychiatrist, and so I shall be looking at, uh, and as I'm the first speaker, I shall be looking at uh, really a lot of facts and figures related to suicide, because we need to set the background to understand what an appalling thing suicide is in our culture. Now, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. You can? Good. Now, can you see it if I change it? Did you see that? Yes, we can see that absolutely fine. Okay. Uh, so, shining light on suicide. Remembering that I'm a neuropsychiatrist and therefore I was trained in medicine, I can remember very well the first time I came across somebody who looks as if she committed suicide, although in fact nothing was found. Um, I'd only been one week on the ward when this woman, favorite budgerigar, died. She ate nothing and drank nothing for uh, almost a whole week before she was admitted to hospital. And in hospital, she clearly was profoundly depressed. And then one week later, she died. And the post-mortem didn't show that she had taken anything at all to kill herself. So she wasn't a suicide from that point of view, but she was a suicide because of her very, very close relationship with this bird. And uh, it taught me that you must never ever take people's relationships with either animals or other humans for granted. Of course, we know that drugs will commit suicide. Uh, here's a photograph of a dog whose master has just died. And he would have stayed on the grave, not eating or drinking. He would have died there if somebody hadn't gone to help him. Now, of course, uh, suicide and suicide paintings are seen in our culture, and some of our greatest artists have suffered from depression and killed themselves by suicide. Just a word about Van Gogh. Uh, this is 1888, when he looked at a pic when he painted this picture, the starry night over the Rhone. The brushwork is well controlled. It's got a nice atmosphere to it. It's a, a good picture of night, of, of night. And he talks about being the closest to heaven. Now note, that's 1888. Here he is again. Um, and this is in 1880, no, 1888. And he's now starting to look depressed, miserable. And again, the brushwork behind him is getting very coarse. And this is a, a year before he committed suicide. 
And here we are in 89, the year he killed himself with this very famous painting of his where the brushwork is almost out of control, vivid, huge strokes. And then unfortunately, he went to a mental institution and shot himself in the abdomen and died. So again, suicides are well within our culture, but some painters paint suicides. And this is a painting of Monet, um, in which, which is called The Suicide. And if you look, it's a rather unusual painting because he hasn't dropped the gun. So is this because he's only just done it? Uh, Manet wanted the uh, Légion d'Honneur, and this painting is a couple of years before he got it. It's been pointed out that on his breast there are blood marks which are very suggestive of the ribbons of the Légion d'Honneur. So is he sending uh, with this rather horrific painting a message to the community or is it that he was feeling like this if in fact he wasn't recognized to the extent that he thought he should be so let's um let's go on now to the actual epidemiology globally more than 350 million people 350 million people of all ages suffer from depression from the age group 15 to 44, major depression is the leading cause of disability in the US. Women are nearly twice as likely to suffer from a major depressive disorder than men are. With age, the symptoms of depression become even more severe. And notice this, will you? About 30% of people with depressive illnesses attempt suicide. This is not a trivial figure. If we take the World uh, Health Organization, that's 100 million people may, in fact, attempt suicide. It's staggering. Um, the people who do are usually depressed. Um, I don't have time to go into the... Um, of neurophysiology of depression, but just to point out, this is a PET scan. On the left is a depressed patient, and on the right is the patient when healthy. And the uh, yellow and reds are the more normally functioning brain than you can see on the left. So I want you to think of depression as, in fact, a brain wide disease and something one should uh, take great care about. So how does neuroscience explain depression? Uh, deep in the brain, the amygdala processes stimuli such as rewards and potential threats. In depression, the amygdala is overactive and responds excessively to negative events. So what is it doing? It's creating a very negative world view. In turn, the amygdala connects to a set of brain regions that hone the physiological and behavioral responses of emotional seriously. So depression can be a, a, a very, very severe disease. Now, I'm going to start with this one, uh, this study, which came from the British Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, and it's a, a group in Uganda who took uh, uh, press reports of 23 Ugandan students, 19 to 25, and their mode of suicide. And I put this up first because I'll be going through the British figures and you'll be, be interested, I think, in the clear cultural component. So 19 male, four female, that's not necessarily held out uh, in, in our culture. Uh, three in the day, 11 at night, that's more like it. Now, look, two burning. No, we don't burn ourselves in our culture if we commit suicide. Seven hanging. Yes, we do, I'm afraid. Jumping from height, we tend not to. We'd rather hang. And five uh, who took poisoning and one person who stabbed himself in the chest. But the other point, I think, is why did they do it? 
Six, end of relationship, very like us. Five, family problems, very like us. Betting, much higher there than we have. Loss of a laptop, one HIV positive, a Bitcoin scam, an academic failure, academic failure, of course, we have. But the others are probably related to the Ugandan culture. So let's go on to the UK suicide figures for 2019. Look at it. 6,524 people took their own life. 6,524 people. It's staggering, absolutely staggering. Highest rate, men aged 45 to 49, and the women were aged 50 to 54. So it's um, as you're moving from middle age towards old age for women, but less so for men. Now look, 7% of UK children have attempted suicide by the age of 17. 7%, that's almost one in 10 of our children will have attempted suicide by the age of some 17. Something very wrong with our culture here. Almost one in four self-harmed in the last year before this study was done. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear that lockdown didn't increase it. Common methods, the most common method of suicide in England and Wales for both males and females. Again, 5,224 people killed themselves. Hanging, strangulation and suffocation. I mean, it's a horrendous figure. Imagine coming home and finding a relative hanging. These accounted for uh, nearly two thirds of all suicides. And the second most common method was poisoning and accounted for uh, just under a quarter of all suicides. So in the period 2018 to 20, 2020, uh, the distribution of suicides, hanging accounted for three quarters of suicides for children aged 10 to 14. I mean, it's a horrific figure. What are we doing to our kids? Hanging falls steadily as age increases. 29% of suicides or a third in people aged 90 years. So it, suicide is very much, in this case, a, um, a younger person's behavior. Conversely, poisoning accounts for 5.6 of suicides for people aged 10 to 14. I mean, the group we were looking at. The proportion increases with age to a third of people aged 19 over. So you poison yourself late in life, but you're very, very violent if you're younger. So suicide occurs most often in older than younger people, but it's still one of the leading causes of death in late childhood and adolescence worldwide. So it's not only us. They're the, the horrendous figures. This not only results in a direct loss of many young lives, but also has disruptive psychosocial and adverse socioeconomic effects. From the perspective of public mental health, suicide among young people is one of the main issues to address, and it really is. Therefore, we need good insight into the risk factors contributing to suicidal behavior in youth. And in fact, there now at long last is the beginning of studies to look at this and then see how effective it is in preventing further suicides. So what are the key risk factors in youth suicides? Mental disorders, of course, amongst these would be the depressions. Previous suicide attempts, if you've done it once, you may do it again specific personality characteristics, and then there is a genetic loading and family process in combination with triggered, uh, triggering psychosocial stresses and the availability of means of committing suicide. Unfortunately, the means, as you saw, are all too available. These factors are highly relevant with regards to the development of effective prevention strategy plans for youth suicide, and we have to do that and be more rigorous. 
I'm going to change the frame now. Instead of looking at people killing themselves, um, but looking at euthanasia, which is the act of intentionally ending a life, your life, to relieve suffering. And that's, for example, a lethal injection administered by a doctor. So why do I say intentionally ending your life? Well, under English law, euthanasia is illegal and is considered manslaughter or murder. But last year, the UK Supreme Court ruled that legal permission would no longer be needed to withdraw treatment from patients in the permanent vegetative state. Permanent vegetative state of people who've had uh, a head injury usually or a stroke and never regain full consciousness. So you can withdraw those. The NHS says withdrawing life-sustaining treatment can be part of good palliative care and should be not confused with euthanasia. And of course, those of you who work in hospices will know this. What about assisted suicide? The that is intentionally helping another person to kill themselves. And that is what is called assisted suicide. This can include providing someone with a strong sedative with which to end their life or buying them a ticket to Switzerland where there's a Dignitas clinic that will allow you to end your life. The Suicide Act of uh, 1961 makes it illegal to encourage or assist a suicide in England and Wales. And those found guilty of the offence could face up to 14 years in prison. And similar laws also exist in Northern Ireland. And it's not uncommon for police to interview relatives after a loved one has ended their life at Dignitas. And I can't think of anything worse than being interviewed by the police because somebody's got motor neurone disease, as uh, Jeff uh, Whaley's had when he went uh, to Dignitas and he terminated his own life there. But his wife was interviewed under caution after police were made aware of his intentions. Uh, in Scotland, there's no specific offence of assisted suicide, but those who do help, to help someone to die could be charged with general offences, uh, general offences such as murder, culpable homicide, or reckless endangerment. Now, the things are changing so fast. I remember about 10 years ago, I had to look at um, suicides and I had to look at the control that parents have over their children. And so uh, it's interesting to see that things are now getting much more liberal. In the, in the Netherlands, both euthanasia and assisted suicide are legal if the patient is enduring unbearable suffering. There's no prospect for improvement. Um, in fact, I spoke to a doctor who when the bill came in, <laughs> was asked by a farmer who was in chronic severe pain if he would uh, administer euthanasia. So he did. He gave him a huge injection of morphine and uh, said goodbye to his wife. Next morning, when he came along to see how things had gone, the patient was sitting up in bed saying he'd had a most wonderful night's rest. Now, I think what this shows us is that if you're going to include uh, euthanasia in the repertoire of medical practitioners, you must train them properly to do it. Now, anyone from age 12 can request this. Did you listen to that? Any from age 12 can request this. But parental consent is required if a child is under 16. Imagine your 12-year-old saying, I'd like to die and they know that they can actually request it. There are a number of checks and balances, including that doctors must consult with at least one other uh, independent do uh, doctor or whether patients meet the necessary criteria. So it is, in fact, policed by the medical profession. Belgium, Luxembourg, Canada, Colombia also allow both euthanasia and assisted suicide, although there are differences. For example, any terminal patients can request it in Colombia, while Benjam, uh, Belgium has no age restriction for children, although they must have a terminal illness. 
we really haven't got things sorted out. Sister suicide is more widely available than euthanasia. Among the places where people can choose to end their life this way are Switzerland, and we all know about the Glutasins in, in Zurich. And a number of US states, including California, Colorado, Hawaii, New Jersey, Oregon, Washington State, Vermont, and the District of Columbia. Um, I put all these in really just to show you what uh, the thinking about suicide in Western culture is. Laws permitting assisted suicide came into force in the Australian uh, state of Victoria last month. So it's still progressing. Again, the exact circumstances in which assisted suicide is allowed vary with different jurisdictions. Oregon and Vermont only allow it in the case of terminal illnesses. For some, Places uh, it is permitted because laws do not prohibit it. And that actually is interesting. For example, in Switzerland, it's an offense to assist a suicide if it is done with a selfish motive. The result of that is there's this growth of not-for-profit organizations. And Professor Penny Lewis at King's College uh, has been uh, looking uh, at these factors. I'm going to end now with two stories. The first is the death of King George V. Um, and this is published in the American Society of Anesthesiologists. Um, and uh, King George V died in 1936. He was terminally bronchitic, bedridden, and passing repeatedly in and out of consciousness. Shortly after 11 p.m. on January the 20th, 1936, the physician in ordinary to the king administered a pair of lethal doses intravenously to hasten the struggling monarch's dreamies. This regicide was only revealed a half century later in the diary of the euthanasia, uh, Lord Dawson of Penn. And he wrote, I therefore decided to determine the end and injected morphia, grains three quarter, and shortly afterwards cocaine, grains one, into the king's distended jugular vein. In order that the news of the king's death could be broken in the morning edition of the Times. I think it's an interesting story and I think um, very helpful, I'm sure, to the royal family. Now, the last one is a case that I came across, one of mine. It was a female student, aged 21, and she attempted suicide by, we know now it's going to be hanging, which it was, and um, she, in fact, was cut down before she, she died, and uh, she had an NDE, and the NDE, uh, was for her the most wonderful thing she'd ever experienced, peace of love and light. And it was quite overwhelming and she wanted to get back to it. And uh, I didn't have her the whole time, but for some of the time, she's a patient of mine in hospital. We had to make sure that she didn't have any uh, dressing gown cords or anything like that that she could use because she'd use them immediately to hang herself. At any rate, we talked to her and uh, sorted things out for her. And uh, after about one year stay in hospital, she returned home. And you'd be pleased to hear that she no longer made another suicide attempt. But I had another patient who was referred to me from Wales. He was a farmer. He too had had a near-death experience. He too sat in the chair after his failed suicide attempt saying he no longer wanted to live, but wanted to get back to the overwhelming peace of love and light. So they need really very careful and experienced handling. So thank you very much for attending uh, to what I've had to say. And this is the end of my presentation. But with those terrible figures for youth suicide, 
we must do something about our culture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter. And yes, absolutely, all those kinds of details, they are shocking to hear, but we need to look at these. We need to understand them because, and again, we shouldn't be hiding these away like a taboo subject. The more that we shine the light on these issues, the better we can understand it and help people in the future. So thank you so much, Peter. I will put you backstage and we'll talk to you again a little bit later. Thank you. Okay. So our next talk today is going to be with, who have we got next? With Tanya Stevanin. Let's bring her on. So... Tanya Stevanin is a microbiologist and clinical hypnotherapist who is a member of the Psychological Society, the Clinical Council for Hypnotherapy, the Association for Solutions Focused Hypnotherapy, and the Complementary and Natural Health Care Council. She is also a co-founder of the Sheffield Spiritus Group here in the UK. So Tanya, thank you so much for being with us. How are you? And how can we make the most of the spiritist teachings to help us fight against suicidal thoughts? So hello everybody around the world. I'm just trying to share my screen here to see if, if you can see my presentation. Uh, not sure if it's working this time, Adam. No, it, it isn't. It isn't just at <laughs> I'll the moment. Try. I'll try That's again. That's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's not letting me show the screen. Uh, I'll just carry on. <laughs> then okay. I'm not sure if, uh, if I'll be able to. But the, the slides I had, they are very, very basic. So uh, thank you, Peter, for your presentation. I thought I, that was extremely interesting. And uh, I hope that this one will add something to people's understanding of how to use the Spiritist teachings to help us in the fight, not just against suicide, but against the mental attitude that often leads to it or leads professionals not to take it seriously enough. And even uh, maybe unconsciously encourage that by seeing challenges in life as a problem rather than an opportunity. So Kardec described that for those who place themselves by means of thought, and thought here is a very important word in the spiritual life, the bodily life becomes a mere temporary stay in an ungrateful country. And the vicissitudes are seen as challenges. This is in an important principle because this is what we want to do, to use the Spiritist teachings to help people to see this greater picture rather than just concentrate on how they are feeling at the moment. Because when someone is very depressed or contemplating suicide, they can't see the way out to the way they feel. And our role and the Spiritist uh, literature provides us with a very great array of information that can help and positive thought patterns that can help people to change, to start changing that perspective and, and see the greater picture. So the descriptions of, our, of, of a future life should awaken or strengthen faith in the future and help people to cope with the trials of the present. So the passage in the Bible, one of the passages, I'll read it out. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be lifted, filled. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the main aspect of this is the fact that Jesus is concentrating, is focusing the mind on what we gain by facing those trials. So he's not face, uh, concentrating on the trials themselves, but he's saying, if you get through this, you'll be rewarded, you get some benefits. 
So choose material from the spiritualist literature that will help people to understand that challenging experiences are not a punishment, but they are opportunities. So often, by just changing a word in the way we express certain thoughts, certain teachings, we can change the whole emotional perspective behind those thoughts. So for example, someone who had lost a loved one who's going through a bereavement and bereavement, there is something called as disenfranchised grief, which is when someone loses a job or loses a pet or loses a way of life because of, a, of illness or an accident or loses a relationship. They go through the process of bereavement. It's a loss, but a loss that's often not recognized by society. As Peter mentioned before, the lady who lost her favorite pet, she was grieving, but that grief was not recognized. So it was not treated. We are not allowed to take time off work when a pet dies. We are not allowed or we don't allow ourselves the freedom to feel the pain in order to overcome the pain. But if we can help people to understand that the loss is not a permanent separation, that there are opportunities to be gained, there are things that we can learn. Sometimes, let's say, uh, it's easy to think about this if it is a member of our families that die and we can say our life continues, you're going to meet again in spirit. However, what if I lost my job and I'm devastated? I don't know if I will have income enough to pay the rent to bring up my children. How can I make that a non-permanent grief? By pointing out to other challenges that I might have overcome in the past, to demonstrate that I have resilience, I have skills, I have, uh, there will be other opportunities, so that I can not just see the loss, but I can see what I can still do with my life. Uh, so trying to identify ways in which to let people see that suffering in the short term is like the study time that helps us to pass our exams, to learn something, to learn skills, to develop abilities, to develop more resilience that an illness may in fact be an opportunity of learning, even though we can't see that right now. Certain things we can only see and perceive in hindsight. And that afflictions are also learning opportunities. So changing the way we express the language we use can be extremely beneficial in helping people to overcome or to withstand the trials of the present. Uh, bringing it back to the spiritualist literature and teachings as such, it is okay to talk about the dangers of suicide, but it's important not to focus on that. We need to focus on how, on aspects of the, the spiritualist teachings that helps people to learn to manage their present. Because focusing on the dangers of suicide, what I will lose, the person is already feeling down. They are already feeling that there is no way out. Just telling someone who's already feeling that depressed that they are going to, to damage themselves, they're going to upset their family, it's not cheering them up. It's not making them feel any happier. It's not providing resilience. It is not lighting up these parts of our brain that needs more light. And I think that picture that Peter showed is a very interesting one because we talk about the light and it was so clear from the two images of the brain how dark our, the mind, the brain of someone deeply depressed is compared to how light it looks when the person is not depressed. And we want to bring light, we want to bring uh, hope. Uh, 
into that person's mind. Spiritism also states that we are the architects of our own suffering. And unfortunately, having come from a background, other religious backgrounds, not just in this life, but in previous lives, uh, I grew up as a Catholic in Brazil. And I know for a fact that there is a great emphasis on sin. Everything is sinful. Everything is a way to hell. And it's very hard to think, okay, uh, I know a lot of the things I shouldn't be doing, but what about the things I should be doing? I should do. So we need to remember that the other side of this argument is that we are also the architects of our own happiness. So rather than concentrate on uh, your suffering because there is a reason for this suffering, you must have done something in the past, and there might be a people that don't like you and are obsessing you now in spirit. Let's look at how we can build our new life, what we can do to create this light, create this happiness that we are not experiencing now. So I, many of you will know that I, I work with people who experience substance misuse, who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. And a lot of my conversation with them is what we call problem-free talk. So rather than just saying, why are you drinking this much? You need to drink less. We talk about how can you make the things you're doing right stronger? How can we make them more frequent in your life? If you are able to go out for a walk, what would motivate you to do that two more times in a week rather than just the once. So we are helping the person to find the materials to build a happier life, a better life. Because guilt takes control away from us. If we feel guilty about something, and a lot of the times when people are severely depressed and contemplating suicide, one of the things that they, they think very strongly is that those they love would be better off without them because they feel that they are a burden in the lives of their loved ones. But then telling them, oh, if you die, if you kill yourself, they're going to be even uh, more unhappy or going to cause even more damage. It's just increasing the guilt. What we want is to help them to take responsibility, to take back control over their behavior. So if I want to encourage them not to kill themselves, also on behalf of their relatives, of their loved ones, I'll say no matter how bad things are, the people who love you want you in their lives. They would be less happy if you were not in their lives. So I'm not saying they are going to be unhappy if you kill yourself. I'm going to say they are going to be less happy if you're not in their lives help them to see that they have the skills, the will to, to do something positive with their lives. So, because telling people who are already in, in emotional agony that they will be worse off if they kill themselves, risk pushing them over the edge. Instead, we need to help them to see how resilient they really are by pointing out that uh, we have to ask the question during our assessment, have you ever considered suicide? Have you ever tried suicide? And a lot of my patients say, yes, yes. And then when I ask, are you still thinking about it? They say, yes. And of course that sends shivers down everybody's spine because now we think, okay, what do I do now? So I tend to ask them, okay, you're still thinking about it. So what helped you? What helps you every day for the past however many weeks or months that you've been feeling this way? What has helped you to resist those thoughts? What gives you motivation to keep going? Because I want to remind them that every single day that they don't do it, they are resisting that thought. So they have strength that they might not have realized. Who else is important for you? A lot of my patients tell me that it is their pets because their pets depend on them. 
and say, if I die, who's going to look after my dog? Who's going to take care of my cat? And that's a protective factor. So we want to help them to remember what is worth living for that they already have in their lives. We want to move their thoughts to what is good in their lives right now and what can become even better in the future. We need to bear in mind that some spiritist teachings, some books may not be appropriate to share with people in the middle of an emotional crisis or even people who are severely depressed because it creates thought patterns that reinforce those negative thought patterns that they already they are fighting with. So we should not, and this I must be quite strong about it, first of all, we need to be extremely careful which books we recommend to people who are undergoing this kind of problem. Memoirs of a suicider and books like that, not appropriate at all. Not even our um, the Astro City. Many of the books of Andrea Louise, which most of us find extremely important in our studies because it provides us with invaluable information for people who are in emotional crisis, it's, it risks some of the, the scenes described in those books are very problematic. It describes areas of the spiritual dimension that are very troubled. And we need to be very careful not to create thought patterns. In Spiritism, we call them thought forms that will cause even more disturbance. We want to create thought forms that help people with light, with happiness, that help to lighten the burden. So choose passages and messages that increase faith and not fear. So we need to, like for example, books of messages, like Our Daily Bread, like Jesus in the Home. Those are wonderful books that we can recommend to people because the messages always say, if you suffer, this is how we can lighten the burden. So be very careful. Uh, the couple of examples from the Gospel according to Spiritism is chapter 2 item 25 about melancholy because this chapter it it helps people feel that they are not alone this is something that happens to a lot of people to feel those feelings of melancholy is normal it's natural and it but it also provides a lot of um motivation also, the ch chapter 9, items 7 and 8, about patience and resignation. Because they are not judgmental. They, they are, these are passages that help to create those positive mental images that helps people to, to be stronger at times of need. Prayer, we talk about, about a lot about prayer, but let's remember that for some people, especially people who are undergoing spiritual obsessions when there is interference from outside as well, creating thoughts of um, low self-esteem, encouraging someone to commit suicide. Those prayer can prayer meditation needs to be dealt with care because if someone goes into uh, an altered state of consciousness, a deeper meditation, it can make the access to them by the obsessors even greater. So active prayer. Active prayer is doing something that is good, doing something that is positive. Active prayer is volunteering, is going out for walks, being involved with activities, positive conversations, um, creating positive mental images. The mind cannot tell the difference between what we imagine and what we do. So if I am imagining light, if I'm imagining doing something positive, it helps my mind to be more positive. It helps to, to give some relief. So for example, ask people when was the last time that they were happy? What 
food they like. So there are many ways that we can use the spiritist teachings to help people who are very depressed or even contemplating suicide. But it's not everything within the spiritist literature that is appropriate. I decided to give this talk because I started coming across examples of conversations and suggestions that well-meaning people made to others in crisis about which books to read from the spiritist literature that I felt was inappropriate and I thought it was important for us to, to have a conversation and review our approach because sometimes with the best intentions we end up causing quite a lot of problems or reinforcing the problem. So not panic, there are many things within the spiritualist literature that can absolutely help people, especially our prayers. So the best service we can do someone is praying for them, sending out positive vibrations, healing to detoxify the, the psychic channels. But if we are encouraging people to read something or engage in certain activities, for example, we should not encourage people who are emotionally fragile to do join a mediumship group. And even studying mediumship may not be the appropriate time for them. They need to attend meetings for healing, for study, before they engage in something like that. They must get involved with the volunteering activities of the group in their local communities to take their minds away from themselves, away from the problem and see the greater picture. It's a great relief when we are doing good to someone else because it takes our minds away from our life and also highlights the fact that other people go through similar things or even bigger things. How do they cope? And when we are helping them, it gives that emotional fuel that we need to feel a bit more positive in our own lives. So if nothing else, keep it simple. Just suggest some books of messages that we know are positive and don't don't suggest a book if you haven't read it yourself and you know exactly what the content is. I've come across so many times books and passages in, in, in the middle of books which I thought, oh my God, this is describing something horrible in such detail that even I was struggling reading that. So maybe the book will end with a positive message, but before you get to the positive message, you have to struggle quite a lot to get through the negative descriptions of some terrible horrors. So if someone is fragile emotionally, we need to keep it simple and provide them with information and advice and support that helps them to feel, to remember the positive, the happiness, and take their mind away from where they are emotionally by encouraging them to read some of the passages, the books of messages that takes them to that positive message. That is me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, I think there's so much wisdom there that we all need to be considerate of, especially, you know, how do we really approach this subject matter when it comes up in conversation. So thank you, Tanya. Uh, I'll pop you backstage and we'll bring you back up a bit later for the Q&A. So uh, just to remind everyone, please send your questions for Tanya, for Peter, for all of our guests in the comments and chats section of wherever you're watching from. Please send us a hello. Let us know where you are, uh, because we love to know where people are. And we have a few people who we could say hello to already. So let's say hello to, oh, if I find the right page, uh, let's say hello to Paola, to Bruce, to Val, to Elsa, to Eliani, to Sol, to Faye, to Karen, Alice, Merlu, Mer Merula as, as well. We've got quite a few people with us already watching uh, watching live on YouTube and Facebook of British Union of Spirit Societies, Spirit Society of Ireland, which is the Irish British Federation, and Kardec Radio. So again, if you're watching, please send us hello. We'd love to know if you're watching with us. Now, we let's bring on our next guest today. Oh, and just to say, 
we are uh, showing on the very bottom of your of the screen. You should be able to see running along all the contact details for both Samaritans in the UK and Crisis Text Line. Uh, they are also in the description of this event. Please do not feel ashamed to pick up the phone or send a message to a, one of these support agencies if ever you need support. So time for our next guest, which is Mick Collins, Dr. Mick Collins. So Mick Collins has worked as a mental health occupational therapist in acute admissions and in a psychological and in psychological therapy service. He has also worked as a lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences of the University of East Anglia. Dr. Collins retired from academia in 2015 and now works in the field of eco-transpersonal development. He has written three books on spirituality and the global crisis. Hello, Mick. How are you? And what can you tell us about finding our way through challenging times? Hi, Adam. Great to be here. And, um, well, I'll, I'll talk a bit about finding our way through challenging times by talking about how I got through my own challenging time. Um, so it's a kind of way of illustrating not that this is the way to go, but it's uh, going to be um, a, a bit of a story of, of quite a shocking journey of awakening. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a tough story to tell, but it's my own personal story uh, where I encountered uh, suicidal thoughts and I got very close to that. And thankfully I didn't do it, but I'm not going to give you a whole view of my life because it's obviously too much to say, but I'm going to talk about a particular period in time. Uh, when I was uh, living in a Buddhist monastery in, between 1983 and 1986, I had, um, after having done some quite deep meditation uh, uh, every day, um, I had an, an awakening experience. And um, when I was on a train reciting mantra, I was going to visit some friends I had this incredible experience of love where I was awoken to this blissful state uh, and it lasted for three days. Those sort of states are not commonly um, that long. They're normally quite short duration. And this was an incredibly powerful experience. I mean, I was radiating bliss in my body and everything was sacred. It was a, what Jung would describe as a numinous experience. It simply wasn't fleeting. It was, in fact, as it went down, from about day two, it started to get less and less, and by the third day, it was finished. But I was quite relieved that it was over. <laughs> it wasn't um, it was just too much. I, I wasn't, I, you know, I don't think I was the, the right container for that type of experience. But it happened. But it, it's really interesting that what happened next it led to an overwhelming encounter, which is now pretty much recognised as a spiritual emergency or a spiritual crisis. Um, so I had this experience in 1986, and Stanislav and Christina Groff wrote their seminal book in 1989. So I was three years having that experience before the book was published. It would have been very helpful if I'd have had that book when I was going through the experience, because there was really, it was like, uh, as Jung describes, a night sea journey, a dark night of the soul, in many ways of describing this. But one of the key features that um, really shocked me was the fact that I was woken up to some incredibly deep complexes within myself. And there's many reasons for that, which I won't go into in this talk. I've written about them elsewhere. But uh, I was plagued with murderous impulses and uh, I was in a very, very paranoid state. Um, it was a very tough time. And that lasted the epicenter of that lasted for two years uh, and it, it sort of started ch change after three. So it was a huge, long time. And like I said, it was a very tough experience and encounter and one that I was unprepared to meet psycho-spiritually. I had no idea what was happening. There I was in this monastery. I'd been a builder's labourer. I'd left school at 15 I've got a, I had a criminal record. I was a bit of a rough dude. <laughs> um, I wasn't, a, I was a bit bad, but it, you know, there was a lot going on. And I found uh, a connection to living in this monastery, which took me into a state of peace and contemplation, which I really started to uh, resonate with. But like I say, when this experience happened, 
it was overwhelm and shock. The only rational sense I could make of it is that I had somehow become possessed by evil. I, I just couldn't believe what was coming up in me. Um, but what, what I sort of started to realize is I'm quite a sociable character. I'm quite easy uh, in my own company as well, but I am sociable and I will connect with people and I enjoy being with people. But I started to become isolated. I left the monastery. Uh, I was fragmented and frightened and I was full of shame for the experiences I was having because to have a murderous impulse, and I'm not talking just a fleeting thought, these were visceral. Uh, they were in my body. I felt these, I had to really manage myself. I've never had anything like this in my life. I was terrified. I mean, it was a shocking thing to experience. So I got to a point where uh, I just, I don't know if I can keep going with this because it was unrelenting. And I had a razor blade one day and I, I put it to my carotid artery on my neck and I was in the bathroom in the mirror and I just thought, you know, I, I've just got to get out of this. But then I think a saving grace was having received many Buddhist teachings about the uh, idea of uh, karma and rebirth and reincarnation. And I thought, well, actually, if that's true, then there's no way out of this because I'll just take what I'm in with me. So uh, that really started to put the cat amongst the pigeons and I was conflicted. So I didn't obviously didn't do it, um, but I was, that's how close I got to doing it. And if I hadn't had that sort of uh, something to gauge against, i.e. the fact that, uh, you know, karma and reincarnation, it stopped me because uh, the Buddhists talk about this precious human rebirth that we have. And one illustration of that is, which I really love, and I'll share it with you, the, the Tibetans teach that if, imagine a yoke was afloat in an ocean, and every hundred years a turtle came up for air, and then the one time it came up, it went, its head went through the yoke, that's like the, the idea of getting a precious human rebirth. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it made me think, right, this is quite important. I, I must work through this experience. And I was very blessed to have met a, um, a, a former mendicant, um, a, a wandering monk in India. He was an Indian man. Uh, he was a psychologist and he worked very closely with Jiddu Krishnamurti. And he used to visit the monastery and he was a very good friend of mine and uh, we, we had good talks. And uh, he heard that I'd left the monastery and I'd gone to live in North Wales. And somehow he got a message to me. I don't know how, because there was no internet or anything like that in those days. But I got this message saying, Mick, if you need to talk, you know, please be in touch. So I went to the phone box and I phoned him and I managed to go and see him in Shropshire. He's passed away now, bless him. But that, this man was a, a catalyst for helping me to understand what I was going through. He, had, he was a, a, a very good man. He'd read all the mystical literature. He was very well experienced with Jung and Freud and what have you. And he said, Mick, if, if you only just understood that what you're going through is deeply transformational, if you can bear it and tolerate it, this will change your life. Now, <laughs> you can't underestimate the words, hearing words like that when you're in the state that I was in. Uh, I was so dissociated, it was unbelievable and barely hanging on in there. How I didn't get sectioned, I'll never know. But I think it's, there was some spirits working with me. The right people here and there just turned up. Arvind Patel was one of them. Um, it also got me into thinking about Jung. And so I realized uh, that I was not in the grip of evil. I was in the grip of an unconscious complex. This thing was having me from the inside and it was having its way with me. It needed awareness. So, you know, <laughs> then the task seemed really overwhelming. So, you know, I sort of realized that uh, the, the, the sort of paradox that I was in, in this living paradox was, A, there seemed to be no escape from this because if you get reborn into another life, you're just going to face what you're in. But there seemed for me in that moment to be no hope. And I was really kind of desperate. And I didn't know this at the time, but over the years that I've been studying, uh, I realized that despair 
The word despair means without hope. And so you start to realize that despair and hope are, are two sort of ends of a process that you need to get to grips with, in which, and that became my work. So um, more recently, since reading the work of Alan Kardec, uh, and this is really instructive, uh, it really helps me look back at what I went through and, and reframes it. it. Kardec says that despair is a form of suicide. And if we invest in despair, then what we're going to have is, you know, a, a life that's just going off the rails. I mean, St uh, Tanya um, alluded to that a minute ago, you know, be very careful about what you invest in and your thought processes. I had no idea about this at the time, but it's really interesting that I did realize the importance of taking action, which is another thing that Tanya said. And um, one of the actions that I took was I joined on the days that I could with the British Trust for Conservation Volunteers. And this is how I got my, my connection to nature. So this is 1987 now, and I'd go out and do a bit of work in nature. And so people there were nice and quiet. There was cups of tea available and I could do a bit of work in nature and come back quite feeling okay. I didn't meditate because uh, it just, every time I tried to meditate, it exacerbated the problems I was in. So I, I left that. I started painting, watercolor painting, doing long walks, and I did the I Ching quite a lot. <laughs> you know, knows the I Ching. It was a form of like having a wise Taoist sage in your in your living room, and that really helped. Sometimes the readings were a little bit obscure, uh, but nonetheless, there was always some type of hope to try and connect to something. So those were the sources of hope in those early days. But to put the whole thing in context, I've been working since 1972 and I very rarely take a day off and I'm very rarely sick. For that period, I was on social security for two years. I just could not work. It was a deeply troubling time and I could just, just about bear to go out and I might sit in a cafe and have a cup of tea and if I met people, they might not know it, but I was freaking out and panicking inside. Obviously, when you're having murderous impulses, the last thing you want to do is be around people. So I was trying to keep myself away from people, but at the same time, a lot of this was being activated. But it's about gradual exposure to um, getting reintroduced back into social life. Over time, I just realized that the more that these impulses were coming up and I hadn't acted on them, that now I had some conviction that, well, OK, I'm now I don't have to I'm not going to be compelled to do this horrible act, uh, which is what I thought would happen. But the more I could work with it and understand it and not react in a frightened way, I realized I was stabilizing. And that led to um, me then having another issue. I sort of started to find sources of hope, but then I, I realized I had no meaning or purpose. And that, that, you know, that may not sound much, but a life without meaning is, is really quite difficult and you know i believe these are some of the sources for our discontent that we don't have any deep meaning and deep connections and when we're blown off course or blown into our life i believe my experience was an awakening and the depth of that experience was a bit like a shamanic initiation as far as i'm concerned but it was the connection with no meaning that started to trouble me but i i've always been somebody that will take action and do things quite sort of um, intently once I've realized I've I've got the, the sort of direction I want. And I realized that helping others might be a way forward. I thought if I've got through this virtually alone, apart from two or three conversations with Arvind Patel, apart from that, I just saw myself through this without any therapy or anything. And it was a hugely demanding task. But I realized that if I could do that, maybe I could be of service. So I that I must try and help others. So I went to uh, college. I'd left school at 15 in 1972, so I had no education. I, I managed to get on a college course to become uh, studying health studies to allow me to get into university, which I did. Um, then I trained to be an occupational therapist and I worked in mental health and in psychological therapies. And I, then I got my vocation. Uh, so all of a sudden the, the deep despair and uh, disconnection that was happening through this experience was now a vehicle for my vocation. Um, but it, 
all the way through this, I haven't spoken much about my earlier life, but I've recognized that this experience brought to a head a karmic challenge. Um, in this life, I've been less than good. I've got a criminal record. Uh, I've done some bad things. And I've realized, and this is more recent, actually, because I'm still on a journey of awakening. This, I'm not done just because I went through a spiritual crisis. That was just the beginning. That was just bringing everything to a head. What I realized is that uh, I've been on a path of atonement uh, to try and remedy the things that have been wrong in the past that, that I did, uh, you know, the, some of the actions that I committed. And I suspect from previous lives, I don't know what they are or, or what I did, but I, I know I've come in with some fairly intense challenges in this life. Um, so the idea then that, you know, I, I sort of got this uh, sense of atonement uh, to work on, uh, and that continues to this day. I'm constantly looking at, you know, what is it that I can do to serve to actually help clear up some of the things that I've done in the past. And I love that, which I read first in um, a, a book that I can't remember the name of it, so I won't try and uh, get that. But the the beautiful connection between atonement and at one that's such a lovely, uh, you know, play on words. But there's a sense of wholeness in that, that when we're atoning, it's not that we're, like Tanya said, you know, getting wrapped up in our, oh, I'm such a bad person. But we're actually looking to atone. And that means becoming at one, becoming whole. Jung talks about individuation. And I love the way that Max Zeller says individuation is a path of becoming whole. It's not a, it's not just a self-centered wholeness, i.e., because individuation connects to the individual who connects to everything, individus, so undivided. So I've got this sense that individuation is about really opening up to that growth and, and potential within ourselves. So how has that potential worked out from being a, a complete wreck in, in 1986? I've gone on to get a degree and a professional life. I've managed to get a PhD. I've written three books all about the psycho-spiritual crisis that we're in at this world, in, in this time it, with the eco-crisis. Uh, I'm deepening my vocation. I'm still working on my vocation, uh, particularly with eco-transpersonal. There's a good reason for that, because I wrote quite a few papers um, previously that the current ecological crisis that we're in is potentially a catalyst for people having spiritual crises. So the global crisis could unleash spiritual crises. If that's the case, then we need much more, and Tanya said, resilience, absolutely, so that people can see this as a rite of passage, not only to clear up our own psychological and past karmic, whatever it is that we've done, but also to leave the world better for future generations. That, that's an act of service. And as uh, Divaldo Franco said, nobody will be exempt from that work. <laughs> and uh, so I think he's absolutely correct there. So there's something I've learned that's quite important here is that from my rather shameful beginnings as an early young teenager who got into a lot of trouble uh, to someone who's on a path of atonement and trying to work, practice forgiveness. And I say try because it is a trial. I'm not, you know, I'm not done. But the idea, I've, I've come to learn that there's no violation that can be stand in the way of spiritual restoration. There's nothing, everything that we've done, no matter how bad or whatever's happened to us, we can restore ourselves. And I think this is so important so that then that becomes a source of hope for each other. So how does it happen then? Uh, I trained as an occupational therapist and doing is one of my things. Uh, I trained also, I did a lot of psychotherapy training uh, but, and being and doing for me go together. In fact, the thing I'm working on at the moment is doing, being, knowing, belonging, becoming and relating. You know, all those together make a, a really rich journey. But good works is where it happens. And an occupational therapist, of course, would be aligned to that. And what are the good works? Well, Alan Kardec uh, teaches us. Uh, via the spirits, uh, the, the spirits that give him these messages, you know, charity, morality, love, justice, kindness, compassion, 
our works are then infused with that, that lead to the greater good. And that, that's really something that's very keen um, in my development. And I, I love the idea then that we're progressing our souls. So, you know, our souls can be uh, linked to tendencies that we might, Jung might say, shadow tendencies. But by working through them, we can actually improve our soulful connection and spiritual connection. So be available for more spiritual illumination by virtue of our soul progression. So uh, thinking about then the Buddhist idea of this precious human rebirth that we've had, if it's as precious as they say it is, and I believe it is, then our actions are blessings, not only for the world, but we're blessed by engaging in actions that are blessed. So there's a, a lovely reciprocal relationship there. And it's a, a, a virtuous cycle, something that can really happen to inspire and uplift us, to make us feel connected to something good and wholesome in life. And the idea, you see that beautifully illustrated in the, the concept of bodhicitta. Uh, the bodhisattva in the Buddhist view is that they relinquish their own quest for enlightenment by virtue of serving every sentient being until they have become enlightened, then they would be willing to uh, be liberated. But there's something beautiful in that because actually the idea to just sit there and think, I want to be enlightened can be quite self-absorbing. The Bodhisattva, in my estimation, doing karma yoga is the real vehicle for, for, for deep transformation because they put everybody else first. The paradox is, and the beautiful secret in this is, the more you do that, the more you're liberating yourself anyway. So it's a win-win. So what are the, one of the things I've read in Alan Kardec by one of the more um, the blessed spirits who gave him this advice, um, and I think it's very pertinent to the time we're living in right now. Uh, the spirit said to Kardec, the robes we weave in this life are the ones we wear in the next. And now that could be like, oh, my Lord, what have I done? What have I done? Yes, you could go along like that, but I don't think that's very productive. You've got to then look at, yes, I've made mistakes. But here right now, today, it starts afresh. I can now make a difference. I'm going to try and try my best to, intentionally to do a bit better today than I did yesterday. And if I fall down, pick yourself up and start again. The idea of just going into a negative spiral of self-destruction, self-recrimination is not productive. I can tell you because I've done it and I've been there and I've seen the consequences of that. So where, what does this leave us then? I'll just conclude in the next minute. Where does this leave us with? The idea then that our efforts should be and could be connected to deep hope. And there's a route to that. And I've just explained what that route is. But more importantly, it's not just driven for our own ego gratification. Deep hope is connected to our soulful engagement and emancipation. And if we then understand that the spiritual forces that are working with us, uh, the more we pray to our guardian angels, the more intent they can be working with us. We know that from great spiritual teachers like um, uh, Padre Pio, a fantastic uh, advocate for, for working with the guardian angel. Chico Xavier, who, who also got this transmission, the path to angelhood. And then our lives become a living prayer. So then we're involved in something emancipatory and for ourselves, of course, naturally, but by virtue of getting into these good works and helping others through good works, it's enabling and, and helping others to lift themselves up as well. So if we live like that, then we become what I like to call, and uh, this is from Michael Washburn, who's a transpersonal philosopher, numinous attractors. I, the spirit is magnetized by our actions and then they can become infectious in a very positive way. So I, I, I've said quite a lot about where I've been to and the path I'm on. Like I said, I'm not done, but this is an ongoing journey of discovery and reflection. And uh yeah, I hope in some way that's given you some insight into somebody who, for whom the wheels came off spectacularly, but actually slowly rebuilding the carriage and finding the sort of direction forward. So uh, that's the end of the talk. And thank you very much for listening. And I'll hand back to Adam. 
Thank you so much, Nick. Uh, Mick. Um, no, so I was taken aback quite a bit by what you were saying, and you know, thank you for sharing your story. I think it's important that people do have the courage to share what they go through. So thank you for that. Thank you. I'll Thank pop you backstage and we'll bring you back a little bit later. So again, if you have any questions for Mick, for Tanya, for Peter, for Marina and Fernanda, please make sure that you put them in the chat or comment area of where you are. Make sure that you send us a hello as well. And you know, as we mentioned at the start, we know that the subject matter we're talking about today affects many people around the world. And if you are in any way affected by this, please find someone who you can talk to. There should never be shame or embarrassment in asking for help, for saying you need support, and certainly never any shame for not feeling happy. So as a reminder, let me bring up the details. If you need any kind of support and are in the UK or Ireland, you can contact the Samaritans at any time on 116123, or you can email them at joe at samaritans.org or joe at samaritans.ie. Crisis Text Line is a free service which offers text message support, which can also be contacted at any time in the UK. Just text the word SHOUT to 85258. In Ireland, text HELLO to 50808. And in the United States, text HOME to 741741. And of course, if you're also in the United States, there is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. Let me just put the main numbers there, scrolling on the bottom of the screen for you for the next few moments. Now, now's the time for you to be able to stretch your legs, go to the toilet, have a cup of tea if you need. Well, we have a couple of little announcements on behalf of BUS and a few spiritist groups here in the UK. Spiritual Light is a weekly show with Charles Kempf, Elsa Rossi, Sylvia Gibbons and Stephen Patozo and takes place every Wednesday. The last episode, they were talking about using hardships to build the future. And you can find that live on the bus, the Irish Federation um, and the Cardiff Radio uh, YouTube and Facebook pages and a few other places as well. Please make sure that you tune in. For those of you who have not seen this so far, every month this year, BUS has been hosting a series of talks to celebrate the 175th anniversary of the French spiritist philosopher, Leon Denis. All the previous talks that you, you can see, some of them here, are on the BUS YouTube channel for you to catch up on. And the next one will be on 2nd of October with Alessandri Caldini, who will be talking about the book Le Pourquoi de la Vie, or The Reason or the Why of Life. So that is on the 2nd of October on the Irish Federation BUS Cardiac Group group and Kardec Radio YouTube and Facebook channels. On Sunday the 3rd of October, so the following day at 11am, Charles Kemp from France will be with us talking about Alan Kardec, a pioneer of science and spirituality. So and that will be on the 3rd of October, which is the anniversary of the birth of Alan Kardec, who obviously without him, we wouldn't have spiritism as it is today. Our very good friends at the Spiritist Society of Bournemouth, in conjunction with the Pooled Christian Spiritist Church, have talks every two weeks on Facebook and YouTube on their channels about the Joanna of Joanna G. Angeli's series of psychological works. And, you know, they've had some very good talks so far. It's always worth going and watching them on Catch Up as well. The last one was yesterday, so the next one will be in two weeks from now on the 24th of September. And of course, I'm from Cardiac Group, and so we need to talk about our little projects here. Insightfully Speaking is produced by us here at Cardiac Group. 
which is available on YouTube and all the main podcast systems. It is a podcast. It's pre-recorded and it's there for your perusal. Um, the most recent episode was with the Brazilian film director, Wagner Giacis, who is talking about his film adaptation of the book Astral City or Nosola, which was codified, which was uh, psychographed by the Brazilian medium Chico Xavier, as well as talking about his hit Netflix film, Kardec, which, well, let's, I think the name gives a clue as to who it's talking about. And he's also talking about some of his exciting new projects. The new episode of Insightfully Speaking will be coming out very soon as well. So you can find that on the Kardec Group uh, YouTube channel, as well as all our social media accounts and any good podcast system. We also want to ask for your help with the High Five fundraising campaign, which is here to help support two important charities in Brazil who help hundreds of people in, lo in their local poor communities with the basic needs. So this is Grupo Espírito Sheila and Instituto Multi Iron. Now, they help with things such as food, housing and work, things which most of us take for granted. Uh, this campaign is by being bun, run by us here at Kardec Group. And if you can, please donate just a small amount each month. It doesn't need to be much, just a small amount each month. Five pounds will do, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, if you're able, because that little help will put a smile on someone's face, because it will put a bit of food on their plate. So, just go to our website, which is www.cardec.org.uk slash high five, and you can find all the details of how to donate either directly to us or to those organizations themselves. And of course, if you want to find any information about spiritism or study groups here in the UK, um, you can find all the details on the BUS website, which is www.busbuss.org.uk. And here we can see all the lovely groups that we have in the UK. We have all the way up in Scotland, in Northern Ireland, right in the Midlands as well, uh, Cambridge area, Plymouth, Southampton, lots around London, in Wales. We've got many, and we've got many of the representatives of those groups online with us today as well. So please go to the BUS website, www.bus.org.uk. You can email them as well, office at bus.org.uk. And of course, follow them on Facebook and the YouTube channel is BUS Audio Visuals, which most of you should be aware of as we have most people watching via that channel right now. And of course, most groups in the UK are still working online with their public group, public study meetings online. Some are having hybrid online and presential meetings, but you can find all details of all groups there on the BUS website. And finally, we'd like to BUS would like to invite everyone to download a free PDF copy of Richard Simonetti's book, Suicide. All you need to know, causes and consequences. And you can get this either by scanning the QR code that's on the screen with your mobile phone or by going to visit the website bit.ly slash bus PDF. So B-I-T dot L-Y slash B-U-S-S P-D-F, exactly as you can see on the screen. Now, for those of you who don't know how to scan a QR code, it's not too tricky. If you're watching this on your computer or on a tablet or on a television, and if you have a fairly newish mobile phone, you can just, let me bring my phone up and I can show you exactly what to do. So you need to open up your camera app and then you need to point it to the screen. And what it will do is, unfortunately, I can't show you this part, but you should then have a little banner popping up at the very top, which you should then be able to tap on that. And in just a moment, it will, he says in just a moment, in just a moment, it will then download the PDF for you there on your phone. So obviously you can only do this if you are watching on something that is not your phone, because you can't use your phone to take a photo of your own screen, unfortunately. But there you go, I'll leave the QR code up there for just a few moments. Uh, but again, if you can't do that, 
just go to the website bit.ly slash b-u-s-s-p-d-f to be able to get a copy of Suicide, All You Need to Know, Causes and Consequences by Richard Simonetti. Okay, so it's now time to bring on our fourth presenter. Let me just bring her on. So we have with us now uh, Marina Stegall, who is a member of the Spiritus Society of Ireland and has spoken at events in Europe and in the USA. Originally from Brazil, Marina has lived in Holland, America, and is now in Ireland. Marina is a coordinator of the Ambassadors of Life campaign, which brings awareness to suicide prevention. Marina, hello. And what can you tell us about being an ambassador of life? Hello, everybody. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you, Buzz, for the invitation. It's great to be here. I loved hearing uh, Peter, Tony, and Dr. Collins. And Dr. Collins, you really touched me with your courage to speak and, and to talk and, and to share your story. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, becoming an ambassador of life. Um, we'll talk about the campaign. I'd also like to share with everybody that we have a new logo. I hope you like it as much as I do. Um, and it's talking about hope and it's about reaching out. So first of all, let me just uh, confirm that everybody can see my screen. I have some numbers here. And the first half of our talk, we're going to talk about the numbers on the left of the screen. And in the second half, we're going to talk about the right. So the facts are not very good, right? So the number of suicides keep increasing. Uh, we really don't believe this, the, the number here that says 700,000 um, suicides a year. Uh, we believe it's a lot more, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. But we know that every 40 seconds, somebody is you know, taking their own lives. Suicide is the fourth cause of death between 15 and 19 years old. And if you look below 29, is the second leading cause of death. We know that there are 20 attempts for every suicide. And every person that takes their own lives, 115 other lives are impacted. So that could mean friends, family, co-workers, and anybody in the community. And more people die from suicide than HIV, malaria, breast cancer, or war. So look that a little bit more in detail, right? So it is a growing concern. Uh, unfortunately, most people don't talk about it. A lot of, um, you know, deaths by suicide are covered by something else. And that's why we say these numbers, they talk about the, the black number. It, it's much greater. But... It doesn't matter what the actual number is. The point is, I know each one of us here today know at least one person that either died from suicide or attempted to commit suicide. So that is why uh, we have been talking about that. So what are the challenges? Well, suicide is a taboo. It's not something that people talk about. You know, a few of my friends told me today, oh, I love to hear you talk, but suicide is heavy. I don't, I don't think I want to talk about that. Um, when somebody we know die from suicide, most people, the family don't, or friends don't want to talk about it. They say it was something else. Um, it's not a conversation that we're willing to have openly. And we hope that today we can change that a little bit, right? There's prejudice against mental health. And I'm so glad Peter talked about depression, right? So you talked about over 300 million people suffering from depression. We have another same amount of people suffering from some kind of uh, anxiety, uh, almost 50 million people um, suffer from bipolar disorders. And if we add all these numbers together, um, mental health disorder is almost a billion people in the world. That's a lot of people. But it's not something we're still comfortable with, right? We call somebody who is depressed, um, weak. Um, sometimes we call them, oh, they're just lazy. These people don't want to work. We accept very well um, diabetes, a heart condition. But when it's about mental health, there's a lot of prejudice. And so imagine instead of somebody having help, they're being shamed from being that situation, right? That's very, very sad. Um, because we don't talk about suicide, because we don't study that enough, um, people don't recognize the signs until after the fact. So for example, 
my physical therapist, his neighbor came to him and said, hey, uh, I'm thinking about killing myself and, and had a conversation. He didn't, he didn't think anything of it. Afterwards, when he was telling me about it, because it turned out that his neighbor went home and that night he shot himself. And after we were talking a little bit about the campaign and some of the things that we learned, he said, well, had I known this, had I known it was serious, had I known that this was a sign, I would have um, called his family, I would have taken his, his weapon you know, away from him, I would have let anybody, you know, somebody who could call somebody know. Um, and, you know, that that is very common, unfortunately. We think after the fact that something could have been done, um, but that's why we want to change it, right? So how can it be that we know before the fact and we can really act upon it? And last but not least, we live in the, the world of social media and we give this false perception that there's this, you know, utopic happiness that, you know, you, somebody can be happy all the time. We share a lot of the good news and we don't share so much of the bad news. And that gives people the impression that they're the only ones who are in pain, which is not true, right? Everybody can go through a hard time. So let's talk about what leads to suicide. And I didn't know that the word despair, despair and hopelessness uh, meant the same thing. So I learned that today. But it's about despair, it's about shame and loneliness. Um, I have the story here of Kevin, um, who is, uh, he tells his story. So his video is in, in our Facebook um, page that I'm going to talk about in a second. And uh, we just talked up today, uh, Peter mentioned depression, right, is a leading cause. So imagine the, the amount of people today, if we say we have 300, 350 million people suffering from depression, at least that they're diagnosed, there, there could be more. Um, how many people are thinking about suicide, right? And here's important one important thing, and that's why I like Kevin's story so much, right? Because Kevin is the only person, um, one of the few people um, that survived jumping out of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. And he only lived because as he jumped, uh, one lady was driving. Uh, he saw her in a red car, and she called... Um, the the guards and, and they, they came on a boat and, and pick him up before he could die from hypothermia. So that is, you know, the only reason. And when he was rescued, um, they asked him, do you know how lucky you are? Do you know how many bodies we have taken out of this uh, waters? And he said, I don't want to know. He said, we have rescued ourselves 57 people and only one alive. So he tells that he was, um, you know, he, he has bipolar disorder. He was having a hard time uh, going through a tough period because his parents were getting divorced. He was a troubled kid. And he, he had this impression, you see, this is the voices in our heads, that he was causing trouble to others. And by dying, he was going to make everybody's lives easier. He knows now that that's not true. He also felt alone and he felt like nobody cared. And today he knows that that's not true, but that's how he felt at the moment. And he walked up and down the Golden Gate Bridge for 40 minutes crying and nobody talked to him. Even the, the police patrol that walks to, to watch for people who wants to jump, they didn't see him. The interesting thing is he says when he, his hands left the, the, the rail, immediately he regretted it. And that is an important point. He didn't want to end his life. He wanted to end the pain. And then they interviewed 19 other people that had survived suicide attempts, and they confirmed the same thing. The immediate feeling at that second is, I don't want to die. So Kevin... Um, you know, survived. Uh, and uh, of course, he had great conversations with his, you know, with his father, who he didn't have the courage to tell him uh, that he was thinking about suicide. And he went on to treatment to his bipolar disorder. He is, he, his life is not easy. So he still copes with, with that. He was into a mental institution seven other times. But here's the interesting thing. The first three times, he was forced in. The next four, he chose to go, which means he developed self-awareness and he also developed coping mechanisms. So he learned that 
exercise is good for him, a certain diet is good for him, a certain routine is good for him, um, his medication, the types of friends that he has. So he has a lot of things that he has been working on, but most importantly, he became a speaker. He became an ambassador of life. He's sharing his story to many others so he can explain that maybe things can change and to raise awareness on suicide prevention. And that's why we have his story in our page. So now let's talk about the next two numbers that I didn't mention, the 70% and the 93%, which is actually the good news. The good news is suicide is preventable and everyone can make a difference. You don't need a PhD, you don't need to be trained, you don't need anything specific. Anybody can make a difference because more than 70% of the people who are thinking about suicide will share and, and will tell somebody about it, at least one person. And the experts believe that more than 90% of the people are, are the suicides can be prevented if friends and family can recognize the signals. And here we have the story of Si Sheng. He's also called the angel of the Nanjing Bridge. That's a bridge in China that's about 150 meters long. This gentleman, that is only asset as a scooter, has volunteered to walk by the bridge or drive his scooter on the bridge every weekend. And he's been doing that for 14 years. And he talks to people. And by doing that, he has saved over 300 lives. These are over 300 people that have not jumped because they had a conversation with him. So he would, sometimes he'll take them home and he will, you know, just just have a conversation and he in the beginning he had a big sign that would say you know if you're thinking about that um call me and he had his number but the sign was heavy and he couldn't walk the entire bridge fast enough so he made a man a metal plate and he put on the rail of the bridge with his number and he said from his phone records he has already received fifty thousand calls or more than 50,000 calls. That's a lot of phone calls. And he, in, in the sign, he says, call me anytime. And that's how easy it is to just show somebody that we care. So we talked to experts and then we were, you know, asking um, people that are um, treating other people or who have a psychology degree to understand a little bit more about how to have the conversation. Because first of all, a lot of people are very scared. They notice something, but they are afraid to reach out. Should I talk about suicide? And what can I say? Yes, we should talk about suicide openly. It's very important to have respect because the causes, and Peter talked a little bit about that, sometimes they can be silly to us, right? Um, a daughter of, of a woman that I know um, tried to kill herself because she didn't get a straight A in math. Um, and she felt that she would be a disappointment to her parents if she didn't have the best grade. It, it wasn't what the parents meant. The parents were very proud of her, but they didn't understand they were putting so much pressure on her by setting that expectation. That wasn't what they, what they wanted, of course. Um, but that's how she interpreted it. And by not having a good grade, she thought she had to die. So one thing we cannot do is to say, oh, that's not a big deal, it's just a relationship, it's just a job. No, we need to, to listen with respect. And if that's troubling the person, we need to take them seriously. So that's the first thing. Then we talked about empathy. It's very important to connect and pay attention to the behaviors, right? It's very normal that the person that's in that trouble will be aggressive and will try to push you away. Of course, they'll try to push everybody that can be of help away. Have the courage to talk openly about suicide. And a way to do that is to say, you know, I understand that people, when they're going through this sort of thing, sometimes they consider taking their own lives. Is that something that has crossed your mind? Would you like to talk about it? And offer support and help. We are not experts, but we can look for help. There's no harm in that. Um, there are a lot of good professionals out there. We can immediately reach out and say, hey, I'm, I'm dealing with somebody who's having this, this conversation. Can you guide me? Can you coach me? What is the right thing to do? How can we um, get in a place where we can get this person going to professional? We talk about listening with compassion. A lot of times we want to lecture somebody who's going through 
something hard and it's not about talking, it's about listening, you know, and, and saying, and, and if the person's going to say, well, you don't know what I'm going through and I don't, but you're important to me. I care about you, right? Recognize the pain. I can see you're in pain. I see that this really troubles you. Just validate that you can see what this person is going through. Maybe we don't understand in detail. That's okay. But at least we recognize and validate the pain. Focus on the now. We don't want to um, make unrealistic promises to say oh, everything's going to be fine. And we cannot promise that. We can just say, you know, let's talk about this now and express love and share our own personal experience. That's why I'm so touched by Dr. Collins. So with that, you know, just picking a lot of information, we created the REACH for LIFE uh, acronym just as a way to cue people into the steps to take. And we can do that at any time. We can pay attention to a colleague that is not, you know, that's been acting strange or a friend that we don't, you know, doesn't return our calls and has been too quiet, doesn't want to get out of the house. Let's just reach out and say, how are you? I'm just checking in on you. I want to know if you're okay. And, and, and if you need me, I'm here and, and I want to talk to you. So I hope that, you know, that's something that we can use and we can have available. And that's why we thought about creating a campaign, right? So the campaign had a name, say, yes to life. And we thought it would be more appropriate to see, to call it ambassadors of life. And that's our new logo talking about reaching out. It is about raising awareness. It is about showing facts, testimonials, articles, things that talk about suicide, depression, and the causes. So everyone can recognize the signs and become an ambassador of life. So all of us can do that. And I'll talk about our Facebook page, and I hope you go in there. I hope you like it. Unfortunately, the social media doesn't promote too, too many things that talk about suicide, so we don't have a lot of reach. We need people to just go in there. There are a lot of good stuff. Go in, like something, share it. Uh, that's how you can help. So talking about raising awareness this is an example of some of the posts that we have. So it's talking about depression. It's talking about somebody sharing their own story about living with depression. It's talking about the ripple effect of suicide and how many people are, um, you know, are impacted by it. We have inspirational notes too. We have people that talk about how they helped somebody else and how they made a difference, right? Sometimes it could be it could be very simple. There's a there's a friend of mine once told me a story that he talked to his cousin and um, distant cousin. Um, they live in different countries, so it's not somebody that he sees often. And he picked up something strange in her tone of voice and the way she was communicating. And he made a note in his diary. I'm like, you know, she's not doing okay. Um, every week, every Friday, he put like phone call to the cousin and he just called her, um, you know, to check on her, to talk about anything. He would say, oh, I just saw a picture of us when we were kids. And sometimes some other time he would say, uh, you know, I was just thinking about the, you know, that Christmas that we had when we were kids and all that. And then he would, you know, ask, you know, I saw this movie, I thought of you. And he was, he would just talk to her and, and check in on her. Years passed. This cousin was then married and she came to visit. And he didn't remember about that anymore. He just let that go. And she was in tears and uh, at some point. And, and her husband was like, tell him, tell him. And it was, she was very emotional. And she said, one of the times um, at that period, I was having a lot of trouble. And one day I was in so much pain that she got a lot of pills and she had it on her lap. And she was ready to take them when the phone rang. And he, he, didn't, he didn't remember, but he said, hey, how are you? What are you doing? And when, she, and when he said that and she heard it, she just said, my God, what am I doing? What, what am I doing? And, and, and then she talked to him on the phone and then she just put all the pills in, in the toilet and flushed it. And, and that was that. But he didn't even know that he was saving a life. But it was that phone call that made a difference. So we like stories like that. If you know any story like that, please share with us. And it's also to mobilize. So it's, you know, communities, we, we all play a role and we are all here to help each other. But most important, we say it's okay to ask for help. If anybody is having a hard time or, you know, we don't need to judge, we don't even need to understand. We just need to say, I hear you. And, and try to see, you know, if it's just an event, if it's just, um, um, you know, something more severe 
and find a way to get a better help. I think we have a lot of the lines here. So there is help available, but sometimes people don't make it to even reaching out. And we all need to connect, right? I think that's the bottom line. We are all in this together and we all have our ups and downs. And if we are together, if we make it a little bit easier, that's uh, the latest post we had in our page is a uh, Sergeant Kevin Briggs. And he talks about being a police patrol also in the Golden Gate Bridge and how many people he has saved. And he talked about just listening. He gives a little bit of, a, of an advice in his video on how to reach out and how to talk. So that's what we talked about today. Um, you know, we hope, you know, within this talk that some of the myths um, are clear from the truth that we, you know, from thinking that suicide is a fatality, you know, we know that it's preventable. And uh, if we recognize the signals from believing that the person wants to end their lives to, you know, the person just wants to end the pain, that there are many causes to know that, you know, it's isolation, despair and, and, and shame and loneliness. Um, from, you know, being a, something that, oh, they, let them take care of it to say, no, we play a role. Let's talk about it. And nobody needs to, to go through it alone. It's okay to ask for help. So let's communicate, connect, and care. So we hope that you're going to join us and become an ambassador of life. It's very easy. Um, we have a Facebook page with a lot of material. We just started um, uh, Instagram, and we're going to be posting as things go along. Please share your stories. Please share in your own pages. Please talk about it. Pay attention to the signals because the more people we can engage, the more impactful we'll be. So that's the end of my story, of my talk today. Thank you so much for listening and uh, we hope to see you on social media soon. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> sorry, that absolutely absolute goes to show the power of needing to talk. And you know, this, those two stories about uh, Kevin and Si Sheng, uh, I've heard them many times before, and they are powerful stories. You know, and uh, Kevin Bridge uh, said at the end, they both they all do fantastic work in helping others, helping others. So thank you so much, uh, Marina, and we'll bring you back on a little bit later for the Q and A. Okay, so. Um, again, if you have any questions for Marina, for Peter, for Mick, for Tanya, and for Fernanda, please put them in the chat and comment area right now. You know, we're almost coming to the end of it, so we've just got Fernanda left. Uh, so please send your questions and or even your hellos as well, so we can come to your questions in a bit. So let's bring on now our final guest of the day. There we go. So we have with us Fernanda Perini, who is a graduate in developmental psychology and a master's in applied positive psychology and coaching. Fernanda is one of the coordinators of the Spiritist Education Department of the British Union of Spiritist Societies. Fernanda, hello. Thank you for being with us. How are you? And how can we have faith? And how can we find hope? Hi, hello, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. And yeah, today I will just talk a little bit about how we can have faith and find hope. So after all this information we had, all these amazing talks, um, I will uh, just try to bring some hope to everyone who may need, yeah? So I will try to, uh, I'm just trying to put it a big, I don't know if it's gonna work. No, I don't think so. I'm just gonna go through like this, yeah? I would like to start, uh, I don't know if it's, it's not moving. No, Is that's it? No? no, that's okay. You can press. Um, no, no, it's not. Uh, I think you need to perhaps reshare your screen. Oh, okay. Okay, sorry, everyone. We'll just sort this out in just one moment. Okay. 
So as we... Can you see? Oh, no. there we go. Yeah? That's, okay. I think that's the one that we want, isn't it? Yes. No? Yes, yes, that, yeah. that's, that's the right one. Okay, all right. So, yeah, um, let's see. I would like to start reading this poem from Antonio Machado. Um, the wind one brilliant day called to my soul with an odor of jasmine. In return for the odor, my jasmine, I like, I'd like all the odor of your roses. I have no roses. All the flowers in my garden are dead. Well, then I will take the whited petals and the yellow leaves and the waters of the fountain. The wind left and I wept. And I said to myself, what have you done with the garden that was trusted to you? So all the flowers in my garden are dead. How many times have we had that feeling or a similar feeling? What are you doing to the gardens that were trusted to us? Most of the times we live in our own heads, lost in our thoughts, somewhere else, not in our body. Like Mr. Duffy, like he lived in a short distance from his body. And when we live most rather ruminating about the past or preoccupied about the future. And that can separate us from our inner self and can give space for an unhappy mind made entity, which is not ourselves. And then it's when it becomes the self negative compulsive thinking. We start to think about we are not good enough, no one like us, uh, we are useless, or we worry about what we're going to be doing, we don't have money, we won't make, we won't be able to make it. So we become, you know trapped in this self-negative compulsive thinking about ourselves, about others, and about the situations in our lives. And this uh, negative, self-negative thinking can just reflect on our, emotion, on our emotions in a negative way. And these negative emotions can just make us feel frustrated, sad, ashamed, scared, um, guilty, jealous, and we can become depressed, depressed, and we can't, we can just kill our hope in this cycle. So how can we break the cycle and have faith to hope again. It's like we, we heard the doctor saying about his experiences. Um, we see that when we find ourselves in this self-negative thinking, it, it's really difficult to um, see some light. However, if we have awareness and we have the acceptance to accept how we were, how the situation are with compassion, we can, we can start seeing that there is a light. Yeah, we can start just, you know, developing this uh, presence in the moment without judging, judging ourselves, judging our thoughts, um, and become kind to our emotions, to our feelings, just letting things be as they are. So once we start uh, opening for this awareness, for this giving space for this self-acceptance, we start having the confidence to find this faith that is inside 
ourselves. And once we find faith, it's when we will start having hope. And faith at its core is deeply rooted in the expectation of good things to come. It goes beyond hope. While much of hope lives in our minds, faith is infused in the heart and the spirit. It lies on the ground of our inner gardens. It can be explained away by reasons or logic or be understood through a single dimension. Uh, we, we just feel it, we can't explain. So we just feel with a deep sense of being. And this deep sense of being comes with our awareness, our presence and acceptance. Once we have developed it, we can have faith. And uh, faith is an essential source for, of hope. And I just would like to share this video. I don't know if it's gonna work. And I would like to just finish with this, this short movie. We can only hear the music. Really? We're not, we're, we're not able to see the video, oh, unfortunately. No? Okay, then no. I think it's just the... Yeah. <laughs> oh. But if you share, so, if if you send the link, uh, we can share it in the chat. Oh, probably, yeah, okay. Yeah. I, th I think last... Let's see. But th that, that's okay. Um, yeah? If you want to describe quickly what the video is. It's just uh, showing that um, it is um, a seed is planted in a pot and then it was watering. And then after a few days, it just started growing and came um, uh, a rain, very strong rain. And um, after the rain, it was still there, it was still strong, and at the end, it was just saying, let me just read it for you. Once the seed of faith takes root, it cannot be blown away, even by the strongest wind. Thank so you. this is the message, it's short, but I hope it could give some inspiration. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Fernanda. And yes, if you send send me the link, I'll make sure I put it in the chat of this. Uh, thank you again for that. That's um, exactly, we need to find those moments of uh, hope and faith, of fi the faith, the good things to come. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Right, I'll pop you backstage for just a few moments and while we look at a few items so again uh, if anyone has any questions for fernanda for marina for uh, tanya for mick or for peter please send them now now's the last chance for you to send um send all your bits through oh um unfortunately we've just lost <laughs> we've just lost fernanda um hopefully she will be back with us in just a moment um but let's just go to a couple of items. So again, you can put your questions or comments in the chat area of where you're watching from. Um, and let's go to a couple of last hellos while we wait for Fernanda. So we can say hello to uh, Linda Alva, to Elsa Lee, to Maria Paola, to Karen, to Elise, to Sandra, to Sol. I think I've said hello to Sol and Faye before. Hello to everyone in Holland, in the UK, in Ireland, in Switzerland, America, and in Brazil. So, um, where are we? So, again, let me bring up all the support numbers. So, 
We know that we're talking about very delicate issues today. So if you need support at any time, if you, your friend, your family, anyone who's going through any difficulty can contact the Samaritans at any time in the UK on 116123 or by emailing joe at samaritans.org or joe at samaritans.ie. In the United States, you can uh, contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, which is on 1-800-273-8255. And there is the text message service through Crisis Text Line, uh, which is um, in the UK, text SHOUT to 85258. In Ireland, text HELLO to 50808. In the US, you can text HOME to 741741. And of course, there are other organizations in the UK and around the world. But the most more important thing, like we've heard today, is that if you need help, if you just need someone to talk to, or even if you just want someone to sit next to you, pick up the phone. You know, even if it's for you, for a family member, for a friend who's going through difficulties, just pick up the phone, send a message speak to someone that's the most important thing um so we're just still waiting for fernanda to come through let me bring on the details for that free pdf once more so you can download a free copy of suicide all you need to know causes and consequences by richard simonetti either by using your phone to scan to try to take a picture of and scan this code that you can see on the screen or by going to your browser and typing in bit.ly slash bus pdf and i'll just leave that on just for a moment so ladies and gentlemen i think it's now time for us to have our q a we will bring on our the guests that we do have with us right now so let's bring back on our guests. Uh, so let's bring on, where are we? Let's bring on Peter Fenwick, Mick Collins, Tanis Stevanin, and Marina Stegall. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being back with us. Let me get rid of the presentation. So th thank you for everything that you've brought to us today. There's been so much wonderful insight which i think is useful to so many people um before we go to any questions from those watching with us and hello to casper who we can hear in the background <laughs> um so before we go to any questions from people watching do you have any questions for each other i have one for peter um peter i was really taken with uh, also the the impact of animals um when their owners funny word their companions human companions pass yes. away and um I, I i had not realized i knew they experienced grief but i i hadn't realized that they would actually stop eating themselves and it really does suggest this universal sense of relationship being really pivotal for being alive yes i absolutely agree with that um we tend to think of um, animals in some sense being subservient to us, but it's very symmetrical. And I've had a number of friends whose dogs have died and they've been distraught. And it's gone on for a uh, really quite a long time. And of course, the, the dogs definitely miss their, their carers. Uh, some people are very cynical. They say, well, you know, they're not being fed, but it's not like that. It's, it is they are grieving for their owners. And cats will do it too. Even Casper, if we go and leave him, abandon him for a bit, will uh, go into a, a depressed state. So, yes, it's common. It's there for everyone. Thank you. And can I ask Mick a question? Uh, yes, please do. Uh, I very much enjoyed your story of the three days when you went into transcendence. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then you slowly came out of it. What I wanted to know is, did you has your mind changed uh, during that time? In other words, I'm trying to see whether or not you feel non-dual or whether you're just driven by the experience itself. In that experience, it was very non-dual. Uh, I mean, I was... Um, Part of everything. Very much. I mean, rubbish on the street, everything. I felt such deep affinity with, you know... Yeah litter and especially if there was a bit of sunshine everything looked like it was illuminated uh, what was interesting mm -hmm. i remember when i got off the train at the destination that i arrived where this awakening experience happened and i was walking down the street and i noticed that a lot of people and this is not common for me were looking at me and smiling <laughs> i must have been <laughs> radiating something but i wasn't <laughs> I wasn't beaming like like this. I was just walking down the street and people were just looking at me and smiling. I thought they must be picking something up. Um, I mean, I was well trained in the Buddhist view that they said, well, don't get attached to those states. Just, you know, be with, let it pass. But it was a very strong sense of oneness. However, um, naturally, when the ego is eclipsed like that, Michael Washburn, the transpersonal philosopher, talks about the ego eclipse, that all the unresolved stuff that's left in the unconscious comes up with a, with a, there's no filters. So up it comes. And, um, and as that experience was, was uh, sort of going down and fading, then this more grim resonance started to take over and i was in that but what's interesting over the years as i've integrated that shadowy experience and worked on those complexes i i did 10 years psychotherapy training and i had to go through my own therapy for years and a transpersonal one and that integration i have a a tendency now to sort of if if i'm able to is to connect with that sort of more resonant state quite quickly these days, although I can still get caught out in more dualistic and divided states as well and shadowy complexes. They do still pop up. I mean, it's a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. uh, do, you call, do you call that state the dark night of the soul or not? Do you feel I, 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 like I, certainly the one that I was in for the, for the best part of, let's say, for three years. I mean, it was a bit less than that, but the epicenter was two years. I mean, Jung talks about the night sea journey, that Absolutely. you're on, the, on a raft at night at sea and you've got no sense of where you're at. And that really did feel like that. I, I was bereft. All my markers for being a human being were really gone. I, I just couldn't relate to anything. And so that was the about like rebuilding again and reconnecting, uh, but with a different framework, not with the old one. Um, but there's yeah, it was a, it was a huge experience, um, you know, really fingernails on the cliff edge, as it were. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. May I ask a question? Um, I have a question for Mick. Um, you mentioned that uh, during the process where you were, you know, struggling and thinking about suicide, that you had a conversation with a friend. Is there anything on that conversation that you think would help anybody who's here who may be confronted with such conversation just to give a cue or, or help or, you know, an advice on what to do and maybe what not to do as well? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I've got to say that man saved my life. He really did. I mean, I was you know, I was really lost. And um, I spent a couple of times at his house. And when when I suggesting that I, I was having murderous impulses, I mean, this is really quite unpleasant stuff, you know, when you've got that going on. And it, there's, I now realize what the history of that was. There's a there's a root cause to that. Um, but it all there it was. And when I went to the toilet at night, let's just this is one indicator. I noticed that his bedroom door was left open. I mean, that's a massive signal that i trust you you know i mean i i was quite moved by just seeing that and you know i thought wow this guy's giving off some incredible um yeah just just tacit signals that he trusted me the second thing is he asked me to draw a picture and i drew a, just drew a picture of a tree which was incredibly muscular 
but all of the roots had been severed with an axe. And it didn't make sense to me, but now it does after I've done a post, a sort of a post Jungian training. <laughs> I thought, my Lord, you know, the disconnection, the dissociation, but he, he helped me see what was going on. But he also said, if you can manage to get through this and trust the process, and he told me to look up Krishnamurti because he was good friends with Krishnamurti. He said, choiceless awareness. And if you can just tolerate the process, this will be transformational. Those words were just like gold because all I could see was devastation, degradation, destruction. You know, I just felt like a living embodiment of evil. That's why I felt. And he said, no, this is a process and you you will find it will be transformational if you can just hold it and not get too attached to the details, but find a way through it. And I did it without a therapist or anything like that. So I know that what it taught me is that human beings are incredibly resilient. And Tanya spoke about resilience. And I truly believe that, you know, if we can just believe that there is this opportunity to grow through these experiences, they're not the end, they're the beginning. And that's what he taught me. Thank you. That's a great story. Thank you. Can I ask Tanya a question? Tanya, you were telling us a lot about Kardec and um, his philosophy. I've read it a little bit about Kardec and um, uh, obviously enormously impressed by his own life and uh, the monument that he has in in Paris as well. Um, what do you, what ha, has, which particular part of Kardec is the most important for you? When, when you picked his books up and looked at them and you think, gosh, yes, this is Kardec. And then you think, yeah, that's it. What, what, what would you pick out? I would pick two books, absolutely the gospel according to spiritism. And that is the one that I would, if I, if I had to pick Kardec to suggest to anyone uh, going through difficulties, it is the gospel according to spiritism that I would suggest because it has those explanations and, and that hopefulness throughout the book. And uh, from a more pragmatic perspective, I would put posthumous works because it shows the man. It shows how meticulous he was in terms of identifying the possible pitfalls in the development of the, the spiritual movement and where us as humans would most likely fail. And he was trying to pre-warn us of those dangers and put some safeguards around the, the developing movement to help people to go along. So from a, a, a spiritual perspective, the gospel according to spiritism yeah. and as, as a spiritist who are involved with the, the movement, I would pick posthumous works. And he was an extraordinary human being because he had those two sides. He had the very human, empathic side, but he also had the very pragmatic, meticulous, detailed, managerial almost side yes. to himself as well. Yes, yes. Thanks very much. Thank you. And of course, to anyone out there who hasn't had a chance to read the books of Kardec yet, uh, the Spirits book is the first of the books and which talks about the connection between physical life and spirit life and what spirits are. And which is also a great Q&A for almost any subject that we have <laughs> nowadays and even written, published 160 years ago. It's still valid nowadays. Okay, any other questions for each other? Mick? Yeah, I've got one for Marina. Um, it's great hearing about your work, Ambassadors for Life. Um, how far do you go with life? <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, we're looking at, uh, I talked about this incarnation and uh, Tanya also spoke about past incarnation. 
where do you go with life? Do you, do you sort of expand on that in the work? Uh, do, you, do you have a spirit, spiritist perspective on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we don't go there. Uh, I think we, we have enough material, I think, content in this life to, to you know, to, to handle our, our challenges and, and, and to address it. I mean, of course, um, when you have a, a spiritual perspective in life, and Jung said that, right, that the people that have some kind of faith are much easier to work with and all of that. So having a faith, you know, having that purpose and the moment of despair makes it a lot easier. Um, we have been staying very much in the pragmatic um, point of, you know, just let's reach out. Sometimes, you know, there was a beautiful article in the Harvard Business Review to say just asking a colleague at work how they're doing can make a huge difference. We have, unfortunately, um, we have a lot of, uh, uh, there's a, a doctor that said that we have never had so many square feet per person, so many things, so many gadgets um and we have been never so disconnected so many we you know we lack we have a lot of friends on social media we have a lot of people following us on instagram and on twitter but real friends the real friend is that person that you can call in the middle of the night and say i need to talk to somebody i'm sorry to wake you up but you need to hear me out on this you know that's a real friend so we're just instilling that spirit of caring for each other of being aware that we belong to a society and it doesn't even matter uh, what you have uh, beyond that, right? So it, of course it helps, but we're not here even to convince people. We say, you know, if that's what you, but that makes you happy. If you're going to a certain tempo, if doing it makes you happy, do that, you know, follow what, what your heart tells you. The important thing is, is I care about you. I'm here for you. And, and so that is kind of the, the approach of the campaign, because if we do that, we can be universal. You don't need to have a certain belief. You need, don't need to have a certain thing. You don't need to follow a certain philosophy. You can just reach out and, and ask for help, right? And that's that's the, the spirit of it, is the spirit that we're all connected in any way we want to call God, in any way we want to call life, in, in any, you know, it doesn't, doesn't matter how far we want to go, Um that we can be connected and we can be there for each other. Thank you. I have a, not a necessarily a question, but a comment. There are two points that I would like to make. In England, there's another number that people can call for an assessment that's 111. So if it's not a life threatening situation, they can call 111. But what a lot of people don't know is that there are two pathways there is the physical health and the mental health pathway. So if someone calls and says, My friend is unwell or I am unwell, if they don't state clearly that it's a mental health crisis, it might go through the physical health questionnaire and then there has been cases where the mental health questions were not asked and then things happened because they were not picked up. So that's quite a, an important piece of information, perhaps. The other one is uh, one thing that is very common when people are in crisis or this is this goes both ways. Also, if I know of someone who might be experiencing crisis at some point is that when they are in the middle of the crisis it's very difficult to articulate how they feel even if it might be even impossible to ask for help because of the way they feel and articulate those feelings that are so overwhelmingly painful may be impossible for them so one technique that can be used quite effectively is to agree beforehand on a keyword so if i feel that i i need to have that conversation with a friend but i can't tell them how i'm feeling if i call and i say um monday that means you need to stay on the phone with me. I might need help. And that is that simplifies that process of communication that warns others that help is needed or just to stay there with them. So I just wanted to point that out because there's something that I, I forgot to mention in my presentation. That's great. Thank you. No, ab absolutely. Obviously, people should always talk to their general practitioner to their doctor to any healthcare worker as well to make sure that they get the support that they need uh we do have a couple of questions here let me see if i can put them on without covering up everyone so we have one from uh 
our friend Faye, who was with us uh, just recently for a Leon Denis talk. How do you impart the notion of purpose and self-worth to someone who can't see any at that specific time who's feeling down? So how can we give someone a bit of purpose and self-worth that maybe, I don't know if Fernanda wants to talk about that, as she was talking about the faith and the hope? All right, or right, who would like to give Mick? I can say something. Yeah, I, you know, when I worked in um, acute admissions, um, I I have published an article on this case, so I can speak about it. But um, yeah, I, I worked with a gentleman who was suicidal and um, had no sense of meaning or purpose in life. But um, sort of as an occupational therapist, one of the great things about doing is that it is a, an active thing that bypasses all of the ruminations when you're involved in something basic like baking, uh, a simple a simple little, maybe a scone or a little bun, um, or making something with clay. It might sound trivial, but in fact, what I found in the many years that I worked in, a, in acute admissions is people would come in particularly if we, if we had a group, but even on their own, they would come into a department and just do something, and all of a sudden there would be a little bit of, it wouldn't be massively purposeful, but there would be a little flicker, a little flame of something of interest, all of a sudden that there's a little interest that's developing. And once you've got that interest, you can gently fan that little flame and it becomes a, an ember that then maybe becomes a bit more lit, a lit up. And um, I've seen that happen a lot. And we used to have a lot of our colleagues used to take the mickey out of us for being occupational therapists. And they'd say, oh, we're going to go and make some fluffy bunnies in, in the OT department. But do you know what? I said, do you know, I don't care what people make. It's what they do and what happens inside of them. It's not the finished product that matters. It's the process. And uh, I've seen some tremendous experiences of people having no hope and then all of a sudden making a cake. And what do you do with the cake? If you've made a lot of them, you share them. And then when you share them, so it says, oh, that's delicious. You've got a feedback loop. And so goes, oh, thank you. And before you know it, you've got a relationship that's a, and you've made those cakes. I mean, they're small things, but I think they're big in, in the beginning of finding hope and purpose because you can't get it all in one go, but you need a little place to start. Yeah. Yes, I, I think the most important thing is in the relationship. In other words, you've got to indicate to the person that you actually care. And it's uh, if, if yeah. that comes across, then they start to trust. And as soon as they start to trust, then they start to open up. But the first bit is to show that you actually do care. And that means that you actually do care. <laughs> And yeah. that's really rather important. Uh, sometimes uh, when you don't, because I, I think the cake story is great because I used to facilitate a, a group and we used to do some knitting and some of the knitting that we collected during the year, we then contributed to other organizations that create that sense of purpose that Meg mm -hmm. was talking about. But sometimes you don't have that time. I, I assessed someone this week who had tried to commit suicide just days before the assessment. Uh, during the assessment was clearly indicating that the suicidal thoughts were still there. So presenting not imminent risk because he, he was trying not to give in to those thoughts. But, and then I had spent 15, 20 minutes asking very um, personal questions, going through all what, about what is wrong in your life to be having this conversation over the telephone, because we are not even seeing people face to face very much at the moment. So I, I finished the conversation by trying to, to create those mental pictures of something more positive. So I asked him at some point, What's your favorite? What's your favorite food? Because what I wanted was to remind him. I wanted him to start reminding himself of moments of pleasure, times he enjoyed something, and then we talked 
in some detail about what his favorite food was, what it tasted like, how long it took to prepare, what kind of ingredients took to prepare. Because the other side of that conversation was, well, if you drink this much less, you can get this much money to buy those ingredients, to cook this food, to create that kind of... And sometimes it's all it takes to get the person to the next day. And if they survive until the next day, then there might be another little conversation like this that takes them to the next day and so on until they get out of the, the worst of the crisis and, and then they can cope a bit better on their own. Okay, any other thoughts or comments on that? Nope. And uh, just to go back with what, what you were saying, Mick and Tanya as well, absolutely, um, just to share a story from myself that uh, years ago we used to help in a charity um, charity lunches for homeless people. And exactly like you were saying, Peter, show that you care because sometimes these people were literally sleeping in tents in the gardens of their friends. Uh, one person, unfortunately, had swine flu many times. He was completely distressed without work for many years. But showing that we cared meant that he was able to pick himself up and luckily able to find, he was able to find a job. Many other people were able to find proper shelter and housing because we know that obviously hunger and poverty is a distressing thing. And that's that's when we need to reach out. We need to show that we do care about people and that we can be, you know, Marina, we can be ambassadors for life uh, for that as well. So we do have one more question and it's just at the point where my mouse has actually stopped working so I can't click on it, but I can read it out. So it's from uh, Elsa Rossi. So how can we make a great force? How can we create a great force for doctors, etc., etc., to work with spirituality awakening and to study the thoughts of suicidal people? Can you read that again? So how can we make a great force, a joint effort yeah. for doctors to work with spiritual awakening in, I think, in, I think, and, and to study uh, the, the thoughts of suicidal people? Yes, I think actually that's a very far-reaching and important question because we're doing a lot of our, our studying in medicine using reductionist ideas. In other words, everything is in the brain and made by the brain. And so you then end up with mind just being another capacity in the brain. And you've missed out the whole of the transcendent world. And uh, th there is so much. It's, it's so much wider. That, and you can deal with, uh, with this much more easily. And one of the things that we did at the... I, I was on the group, although it was done by Andrew Powell, the Royal College of Psychiatrists. We started the um, special interest group in spirituality. And that was enormously important. And it's grown to be one of the largest special interest groups in the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And this is simply because it had been uh, really lost to general psychiatry. I mean, it was always there around the edges. Sorry, Casper, I didn't mean to frighten you. Um, uh, it's always there around the edges, but in actual fact, to have a special group where people could, uh, good, he's not going to walk on the key, and that's good. Uh, a, a special group that they could, in fact, say some of the things that were really most important to them as psychiatrists, and these were the, the spiritual ideas that they had, has been very influential. So I think that uh, we now have come to realize that reductionist science is excellent for what it does, but uh, um, uh, science beyond that is really what it's about. So it's only half a science. Yeah, I could say something about that as well. Um, I think one of the issues for our culture, particularly um, in, in the, the, the Western industrialized cultures, is there's been a, a, a big investment in sort of 
fixing people rather than getting into the process of what's going on. And one thing we've avoided, which we could really help us, is is more investment in transpersonal psychology. Uh, the works of Carl Jung, the works of Stanislav Grof, the works of many other people that show that uh, these expanded states that Peter was speaking about, um, when you have threshold experiences, I like the one I had, which was a transpersonal experience, when you get to that threshold, your identity is shattered and confused, but that's not the end. A transper- And I was so lucky that I met transpersonalists. I don't know what would have happened if I'd have met reductionists. I might have had a very different experience. But um, I met transpersonalists, and they encouraged me to keep going and keep growing. And I, I think if we're going to really get to grips with these threshold experiences, these pivotal moments in people's development, because we're all developing, uh, we, we need more investment in the transpersonal. But I think there's a fear because... It's not about fixing people. And that's what we've been too programmed to do. We need to understand how to be with people in process. Yes, and I think that we have to understand that drugs are not the only answer. Mm. And uh, at one point, I could see the psychiatry was going to collapse into just giving antidepressants uh, and anti-axiolytic drugs. Now I think it's got new life again. So I think it's exciting. Yeah. I love this discussion, and because you were talking, because you had asked me a question, um, there are a couple of posts that I think touch on that that we have. Um, there's one doctor that he was there, and I don't remember all the names, but they're all in the, in the Facebook page. You can find the, the, the testimonials and the videos there. Uh, an American doctor that was very animated about this only, this only bring his matter until he had his own near death experience and he changed his opinion. So there's an article there saying how he changed his opinion from going through his own experience. There's another doctor in his TED talk that he he made a study on death. He said, medicine studies life very much, nobody studies death. And is a huge percentage, like 75% of people that were about to die had an experience to say, oh, my grandmother came here, my husband came and they said, I'm, they're gonna come take me. Or they had some experience that was, you know, that showed, uh, you know, another life. Uh, and there's also a study uh, from Harvard, it's the longest longevity study they had. They, they ran this for 75 years. So they had two, three generations in the study about happiness. And, you know, they measure everything, you know, blood pressure, you know, cholesterol, uh, income levels, you know, types of professions, education levels. They tried to, ma- to map out as many things as they could on a person to find out what makes them happy. And it came down to the meaning of relationships. You know, people that were, even if they were in very poor health, but they said, well, I have my children, my grandchildren with me, I'm going to be okay. They, they had that joy of life and about connecting. So I think it all goes back to the same point about how do we find that meaning? You know, how do we find what is really relevant to us? And, and I loved what you said, um, the, the story about serving, that as we are serving, we're actually doing more for ourselves than we're doing for others, right? And, and I think that as, as we become more giving, more loving, and you talk about the process of life, so as we get involved with the process of life is where we're going to find our answers and our own joy and fulfillment. Lovely, lovely. Perfect. Okay, well, we do need to actually come to an end at some <laughs> point. So are there any last considerations from anyone? I know that we've had a lot of wonderful, insightful knowledge shared with us today. Yes, I think that my insightful understanding is we don't talk enough about suicide. We don't actually show that we're ready and aware of it with the result that it gets gets hidden. So I think today has been a very useful day from that point of view. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I think also today has illustrated that suicide is not just when someone hangs themselves or takes an overdose or shoots themselves in the head. Mm-hmm. There is this low suicide of loss of meaning to life, long-term depression that leads people to die earlier and the euthanasia aspect as well, which seems to be spreading to many countries in different ways kind of infiltrating our medical system so we need to keep an eye on that as well 
Ben, I, I also think the title of this conference is brilliant because understanding that life is always worth it. <laughs> You know, we, we need to talk more about that as well, because there are always going to be really tough, cha challenging times, as we've all discussed tonight. But somehow to have a culture that really understands that it, life is really worth it. And, and what does that mean? Because that then opens up a whole new um, sort of avenues for discussion and experience. From my end, I would like to say thank you for, to everybody. Thank you, Adam, and thank you, Buzz. Thank you, all of you speakers that I learned so much uh, from today. And if you're out there and you're thinking of suicide, you're not alone. You know, please reach out. It's okay to ask for help. And if you're not, you can save a life and you can make a difference. Yeah, I just would like to add to everyone and say like, it's okay if you're not feeling, if you're not feeling well, just talk, just ask for help. It's, yeah. you, will, you will feel sometimes not, like, there's no shame to go for help. Exactly. Well, that's it. We do have to end. So thank you so much once again. So let's say a big thank you and put them all backstage once more to thank you, Peter, Fen Fennick, Mick Collins, Fernanda Perini, Marina Stigol, and Tanis, Tanis Devanin for being with us, for sharing all this wonderful knowledge. I'll put you all backstage. Stay there and I'll talk to you just after the event. So let's just say thank you once more to you all. And as I just whip them all back there there we go and again we'd just like to say thank you to everyone who's been with us today so uh thank you elza bruce val El eliani eliani soul fay paula alice karen sandra elsa lee lynn dalva maria paula sandra again uh maria and john carlos and all the other people who may be watching us on catch up we're sure, sorry that you weren't able to watch us live but we hope that this these talks have been helpful to you or your friends or your family so we do need to obviously give a big thank you to the british union of spiritist societies to Cardiac radio and the irish spiritist federation and of course the ambassadors of life campaign and remember, you can still get your free PDF copy of Suicide, All You Need to Know, Causes and Consequences by Richard Simonetti. Uh, you can find the details in this, in the details of this event as well. And of course, like we said before, if you need support, here are those very important contact numbers again for Samaritans, Crisis Text Line, National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And like we said, talk to your GP, talk to friends, talk to family, talk to anyone who can help. And you know, we hope that this event has been useful to you. And remember, no matter what you, your friends, or your family are going through, it is okay to ask for help. Difficulties come and go. They do not last forever. We are all in this together and can help each other because we are all part of life and life is always worth it. Take care and we hope to see you all again soon. <laughs>